air is 21% oxygen and 0.03% carbon dioxide. Both oxygen and carbon dioxide dissolve in water, but oxygen is not very soluble in water. At most, water holds only 10 mils of oxygen per liter of water. The amount of either gas that can be in aqueous solution depends upon the partial pressure of oxygen or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in an atmosphere or gas mix in contact with the fluid. The temperature also affects how much oxygen and carbon dioxide can be held in solution. Let me sketch through how that might work. So here's water. The molecules above it are about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen and a tiny proportion carbon dioxide, much less than 1%, and we'll ignore it for the discussion right now. So these molecules are all bouncing around at random. At the air-water interface, there are water molecules that are interacting with each other using hydrogen bonds. And any molecule of a gas that comes down has a chance of hitting a water molecule and bouncing away, or of going between water molecules and entering the water. The same is true for nitrogen and oxygen. The total pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury, Hg, which is equal to the SI unit, 101 kilopascals. Unfortunately, this is the one that's used all the time, millimeters of mercury in the United States instead of the SI unit. So that's what we're stuck with. About 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen, which means 0 0.21 times 760 equals 159 millimeters of mercury partial pressure. So the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level is 159, and we usually round to, in this class, 160 millimeters of mercury. That would also be equal to about 21 kilopascals. Nitrogen, which we won't pay much attention to, is about 79%, so 0 0.79 times 760 equals about 600 millimeters of mercury, or about 80 kilopascals. And carbon dioxide, 0.03% of the atmosphere, less than one millimeter of mercury partial pressure. At equilibrium, the oxygen coming in to water matches the oxygen leaving. So A, the oxygen coming in, matches the oxygen leaving. And in many bodies of water, at the surface at least, there'll be an equilibrium. But of course, if there's net oxygen production or consumption in either place, then there'll be a gradient, and oxygen will move down its partial pressure gradient. So if we had one liter of gas above one liter of water, and we were at zero degrees centigrade, or just above, say, one degree centigrade, then in the liter up above, we'd have 210 mils of oxygen and 790 milliliters of nitrogen, together forming one liter with, of course, a trace amount of carbon dioxide. But in the water, at this cold temperature, we'd only have 10 milliliters of oxygen and uh, we'd have a higher proportion of nitrogen, which we won't talk further about. So at equilibrium, then, at this cold temperature, we'd have oxygen coming in, oxygen going out, in which there's a much higher concentration, 210 mils of oxygen per liter, than there is in the water. Clearly, oxygen is not moving down a concentration gradient. Instead, oxygen is following partial pressure gradients. Or in many cases, we t in water we talk about gas tension, but the language often is partial pressure. So at this point in equilibrium, the partial pressures are equivalent. There's a reason for talking about gas tension, which we'll come back to in a moment. I want you thinking about why is it that we can have 210 mils per liter of oxygen and only 10 mils per liter in water. So we need to think about the fact that oxygen is completely nonpolar. The electrons are perfectly evenly shared between the two oxygens, whereas water is not. Water molecule here, this is slightly polar. These hydrogens are a little bit positive, the oxygens are a little bit negative. 
an oxygen molecule here and some water molecules around it. This oxygen molecule is attracted to none of these water molecules around it, but if we zoom in, the positive parts of the water, the, these hydrogens, are going to be attracted to the negatively charged oxygens and vice versa. Water molecules are being attracted to each other and as they move, tends to push oxygen out. Oxygen, because it's nonpolar, has no attraction to these water molecules. Nothing tends to hold it in, but other molecules jostling around it tend to push it out. So oxygen has a high tendency to leave relative to its tendency to enter. In contrast, if we looked at carbon dioxide, that is a slightly charged molecule at the two oxygens. The oxygens tend to hold the electrons a little more than the carbons, and so the carbons tend to be slightly positive compared to the oxygen. And carbon dioxides wind up being attracted to water molecules. And so each of these areas of hydrogen bonding these attractions tend to hold the carbon dioxide. And a result, as a result, carbon dioxide is much more soluble, approximately 10 times more soluble in water than oxygen. Heat will drive these molecules out. So if there's an oxygen here, faster movement of water molecules will tend to drive oxygen out faster so that at 37 degrees human body temperature, there's maybe five mils of oxygen per liter. And remember at boiling, even water molecules are being driven off as gas. At boiling, there's zero oxygen per milliliters. Even water is being driven off. So warm water has less oxygen, and that has consequences for animals that live in warm water. And it has consequences for oxygen transport when conditions are warm. So when we're talking about air or water across a tissue layer, here's an epithelial layer of cells with basement membrane. Underneath it may be capillaries. Carbon dioxide will move across membranes very easily. Carbon dioxide leaves earlier, leaves easily. In contrast, oxygen might be somewhere around 160 millimeters of mercury partial pressure in water, and it's being depleted in blood, and so oxygen will move in down its partial pressure gradient.